Hi, I'm Everett. Welcome back to the shop. Uh, this time I have another one of those projects I brought home from work for my buddy who I now just so happen to work for. Uh, what we have in the shop is a uh, CAT MXS1 uh, variant of the C15, basically a big 15 liter inline six engine for a highway tractor. Uh, we have a flywheel we have to use on this engine um, the only thing, in, and it's actually, the flywheel is off the CAT 3406, uh, which is an older variant of the similar class of engine that CAT has made. Uh, most of the dimensions are the same. Uh, bolt pattern, uh, diameter, number of teeth for the ring gear, all that fun stuff is all the same. Biggest issue is the fact that when you try to use a modern clutch, like a, a newer one, um, what we're finding is, or what we had found when we tried to reuse this flywheel before, uh, was that uh, the hole in the center is actually too small to allow the torsion springs and um, center hub assembly of the, uh, the clutch disc itself to, to fit in. And so you get interference issues. Um, because of that, uh, what we're going to do is we're actually going to have to enlarge the hole in the center of this, uh, center of this flywheel. Uh, the lathe just doesn't have quite enough swing. I'm about an inch and a half, two inches shy of swing to be able to just cut it out on the lathe. Uh, however, I do have a rotary table, and uh, it's going to be nip and tuck, but we'll be able to just fit it onto the mill. So anyway, uh, that's what I'm up against, is making an old flywheel fit a newer truck. So I uh, hope you find it interesting. So this is our CAT 3406 flywheel. It, these things are heavy, trust me. Um, the, uh, you can see even here, if you look really closely, a few scratches, that's how we, you know, when we found out the hard way that the newer style clutches wouldn't fit in. So, uh, in order to use this on the newer engine, we have to open it up. These whole, or these scratch marks here are actually a fair ways in from where we need to cut. Um, our hole here is roughly 8.6 inches, otherwise known as 218 millimeters or so. Um, we're going to have to open it up to a 10 inch bore, which is, well, I'm just going to go to 254 millimeters on the, uh, on the screen here, just to give you a visualization. So we'll have to open it up to about there, roughly three quarters of an inch, 19 millimeters aside. Um, the depth we have to go down, uh, I took a measurement off of a flywheel we have on the floor. Yes, the flywheel is off of a Cummins, but it's made to fit these, uh, made to fit the same clutches. Um, so we're going to have to go down uh, about 730 thousandths or eh, a little over 18 millimeters, I guess, 18 millimeters or so and uh, from the surface. And what I want to do is I want to put a small radius in the bottom. Uh, that'll help to avoid any sort of stress risers of a sharp square corner from an end mill. But before we can do this, we have to get the mill set up and, well, uh, figure out how we're going to hold this and uh, keep this accurate as we cut it. Now this time before I set up the rotary table, I want to do something I've been wanting to do to this thing for a very long time. Um, over time you get little dings and scratches and nicks and whatever in your table and I mean I have I have a basic stone I've rubbed on it a little bit and you know try to get some of the ding or you know, the uh, raised bits of the dings out whatever. Well a little while ago you know, Steve Lang over at Shark River Machine, that's uh, one of his stickers. He sent me another one with this box here. Um, here's his uh, business card with his email address. So by all means, you know, give him a shout. He's a good guy. Um, we uh, get, uh, contacted him and wound up ordering a set of stones. And, you know, thanks, Steve. I appreciate you doing what you did for me. Uh, this is awesome. Um, what we're going to do is I'm going to play with my set of brand new precision ground stones from Steve. First time I've unpackaged them, so got nice uh, tissue paper wrapping them. Try not to drop them and ding them, because that would be just the way I'd roll. And here we go, here's one. So now that they're unboxed, um, I just want to... I don't know if you can hear that. And if I pull them apart quickly, it almost has that same vacuum effect like you get with a uh, um, uh, with a gauge block. And uh, anyway, I've I've wanted a set of these for a long time, so thanks again, Steve. I just I've heard that that sound on other people's videos, and it just have been 
I've been wanting a set for a while. So before we do anything though, is I'm gonna take a little bit of something to degrease. I'm just gonna take the oil film off of the top of our table. The reason I'm doing this is because like Steve was saying in his use and care video, which I will put the description in the, uh, or the link in the description below. He was mentioning that if it's not degreased, that the oil will take the little bits of metal and uh, load up the stones. So, I'm just taking a you know, little bit of degreasing here, try to get uh, some of the grunge off of it. I'm not worried about the table rusting because here in Alberta it's generally not as high a humidity as some other places, as well as the fact that uh, this thing's going to get covered in oil at some point again anyway. So, there, we're all degreased, a bunch of grunge off the table. And oh, you can even hear the difference. Hmm. <laughs> oh, my. I don't know how many of those dings you can see in the camera that they're, that are now coming out, but I can see where it's taking the tops off these off the dings. Yeah, these are doing a much better job than my hardware store stone. Wow, that's really bringing out the... Ends of the tables here. Now, I'm sure there's something I'm doing wrong in my technique here. I certainly don't claim to be anything but an amateur when it comes to machining. But I tell you, I had no idea there were that many dings that were sticking up like that. Like I say, my department store stone obviously didn't do 100%. But yeah, anyway, these are uh, precision ground stones. Um, uh, seriously, give uh, give Steve some love. Give him a call. Uh, send him an email. They're they're definitely worth it. So, thanks again, Steve. I've set the rotary table up on the table here. Um, I just used a square against the back surface to against this face to get it square. For what we're doing here, this is going to be plenty close enough for the tri square. As it is, I've also just taken and using my dial test indicator and my uh, homemade holder, uh, we're zeroed against the center of the bore. Uh, the center line of the quill is now uh, concentric with the center line of the, uh, of the table. At some point here, I'm going to make one of those uh, holders, the GTWR uh, design that uh, Stefan Gottesvinter made. But I just haven't had the time. I had to scrap around and I made that one. Now, one of the issues right now is the flywheel will not sit in here and have enough clearance to the, uh, to the base. So we have our x-axis here locked. We're going to do everything in y. Now, we're concentric, so as I pull it 
toward myself, pull the table this way, we are actually maintaining, um, uh, well basically maintaining the axis with uh, the center line here so that I can still at least use my uh, hand wheel down here for my Y axis as, you know, a somewhat, or somewhat reliable uh, reference. Let's bring this back and grab our flywheel. Ugh. Okay. So as I say, <laughs> it's a bit of a stretch. <laughs> oh, okay. So now we'll be able to bring our table out. And yes, it's reaching close to the, like it's, it's bringing the table travel out this way quite a bit. That's okay. Because by the time we get a three quarter inch end mill in here, or roughly 19 millimeters, it'll just basically fit the machine. So what I need to do now is um, put some T-nuts in from the bottom, uh, T or some bolts down from the top, uh, uh, tighten it to the table, and then set concentricity of the flywheel itself, the center line here, to the center line of the table, of the rotary table. That way I can spin this thing and um, it's, uh, you know, and then we're, we're not going to take more off of one side than off the other. As long as we remove the same amount of material from both sides, well, sides, it's a circle. Anyway, as long as we remove the same amount of material all the way around, it shouldn't affect the balance too much. So I will pause here and do the fiddly bits off camera and bring you back in. I'm using this uh, journal down here as a register. It would have been machined at the same time as this lip and all that other fun stuff inside. And so that should be concentric. And as I spin this, I know you can't really see the needle from where you're sitting, but we're well within one thousandth of an inch um, all the way, you know, of run out as far as needle deflection. So all the way around. It's plenty good enough for what we're going to be doing. So loosen you off. Yep, for a piece of scrap metal I had kicking around, I'm very thankful to have made this. So we got the mill set to 285 RPM, got a 19 millimeter, well, three quarter inch rather, but you know, roughly 19 millimeter end mill. There we go. It's our zero point. Let's do this. We'll back this off. Okay. Say so take a 20 thou depth of cut. And then pull into it and then turn. Actually, this is what I'm using for a uh, power feed. I got a bolt into the end of the shaft. A bit of run out to it, but I also haven't figured out a more elegant way of doing it yet. That's halfway across the end mill. Now, we gently Again, this being cast iron, we're not using any sort of lubricant.
Bring her back around to the front. That's actually not looking bad. Not looking bad at all. There we are. Good luck. Move it back in. Yep, it's coming. I'm going to have to make a lot of passes here, so I'm just going to pause right now and uh, I'll bring you back in once we're a little further down. You don't want to watch every pass. So, we're going to now do the last cut on the inside course here. Uh, that's going to give us the, um, well, basically the bottom of the radius or this edge of the radius um, that's then going to come up and uh, meet the, the uh, wall that we're going to cut next. We're now at uh, 675 thousandths uh, from the top of the, of the surface here. Um, that Cummins flywheel I'm just sort of modeling after, it's 730 thousandths from the top. We're just going to go to 725, 5 thousandths is close enough. Um, it's just clearance for the, uh, uh, like I say, for the torsion springs and such in the front of that clutch disc. There you go, 725. Now what I'm finding here is I've actually been taking 50 thousandths cuts. It seems to be taking it. I mean, it's definitely working it. As I feed in, I actually have to rotate a little bit or it starts um, chattering. And once you get going, it's actually not bad for chatter. As long as you give it a steady chip load. Like I say, as long as we keep a reasonably steady chip load on it, it doesn't chatter too badly. Bring it back in when we're down to the uh, step. There we go. So that was the last pass with the square ended uh, standard end mill. It's, uh, I just want to put a radius into this uh, shoulder here and take it down quite a ways. I'm just kind of curious how much I can get away with. I 
That's probably it there. This portion over here, I'll deal with after. It's all going to get cut out as this uh, radius goes further and further down. I'll bring you all back in when we're further in. There we go. Um, I realize that you can just feel a little bit of a lip here and a little bit of a lip here. That's not going to be that big of a deal. Um, yeah, I am happy with that. I'm just going to deburr this and uh, pull it off the table and we're done. Well, after all that, we definitely have a significant difference. What's most important is we now have a 10 inch or whatever 254 millimeter hole in the center. So I can take this to work with me tomorrow and uh, we can get this engine uh, put together and in the truck. Now I, I will totally admit uh, the way I did it, uh, it took a few hours. If you had a lathe that had a wide enough swing to, uh, to be able to turn this, it would have taken an hour, maybe an hour and a half to, you know, including setup to deal with it so this was not the most efficient way of doing it it's effective it does work but it's just not the most efficient so I totally admit that um, the thing is when you're at home and you're working with hobby size equipment sometimes you have to uh, do things a little differently in order to get the job done even if it takes longer so I hope you found it at least somewhat interesting um, again not the most efficient is time wise I know but uh, for somebody who doesn't have you know large size metalworking equipment I mean I you know try to do what I can with what I have so uh, otherwise I just wanted to say thank you to everybody who's uh, supported me in various different ways you know comments the you know emails the likes subscriptions if you haven't subscribed that's totally cool you know thanks for coming by thanks for uh, looking around uh, thanks for joining in on the fun on the channel. So like I say, thanks for everything and I'll see you next time.